Welcome back to Life Under Deborah's Palm, where we continue to look at the Who is Jesus series and last video and blog, I did the first four I am statements that Jesus said about himself. And today we're gonna finish the last three that Jesus said about himself. Little housekeeping, if you like this channel, please like, subscribe, share, hit the notification bell so you know when the new videos come out, I am getting on a weekly schedule. That being said, there's also links to my website in the description below, as well as a novel I wrote. You might have to copy and paste if you're outside of the US, but the US, the link should take you straight to Amazon. Okay, enough with that. We're going to J back to John chapter 11, 25, verse 25. The backstory to this is Jesus has made friends with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They are siblings. Jesus receives word that Lazarus is sick and that they need him to come. Jesus looks at his disciples and said, this sickness isn't going to end in death and continues what he's doing. So it takes them a couple days to, you know, mosey on over to see what's up with Mary Martha and dying Lazarus. He gets there and Lazarus is dead. Martha comes running out to meet him and said, it, you know, if you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. And Jesus is like, yeah, don't worry about it. So Jesus explains to Martha, he says, you know, Martha, he's going to rise again. And Martha says, yeah, I know that in the last days, because the Jewish people knew there was a resurrection of the dead. But Jesus says to her in John 11, 25, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. So they go to the tomb and Jesus wants them to roll the stone away. And they're going, yo, Jesus, the dude's been dead four days. He's gonna be, he's gonna stink. Jesus is unfazed. They roll the stone away and Jesus stands outside the tomb and just calls Lazarus, Lazarus forth. Well, Lazarus comes walking out with, they call them grave clothes or linens. Think kind of like a mummy. That's the best way I can describe that. Lazarus walks out. So the point Jesus was making is that he is the resurrection and the life. And he gave life back to Lazarus here on this earth in the physical world. And when you die, you live forever if you believe in him, which is also what was said in that passage of scripture. And Jesus was both things. Jesus was producing the resurrection, but Jesus really is the resurrection. The resurrection is, is a person. It's Jesus. And he has the ability to produce, bring life from the literal physical dead, as well as life to the spiritually dead and life in the afterlife after we die. Did that make sense? On to the next one. Number six. Backstory because you gotta know the backstory. Jesus is talking to his disciples, his time's almost up, and he starts telling them, hey, well, I'm, well, I'm gonna get betrayed, and this is how it's gonna go. And the disciples, you know, they get really bummed out, and he begins to comfort them. And he tells them that he's going ahead of them. Basically, he's going to heaven, but he's saying, I'm going to go to, uh, ahead of you and prepare the place that you will come. You will follow me one day. I'll be back for you. And Thomas, who often gets called doubting Thomas, Thomas says, but where are you going? We don't, we don't know how to find you or follow you if we don't know where you're going. They don't, they don't quite get it. And Jesus replies and says, this is John 14, 6. He says to Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is making the point that he is the only way to God. He's the only way to God. He is the only way to heaven. He is the truth. And in John 8, I believe it is, Jesus says, you know, you'll know me. I'm the truth. I'll set you free. I'm going to give you life. I'll give you life on this earth. I'll give you life in the afterlife. And that is what is he, he's explaining to Thomas, that he's got to go 
so they can live an abundant life here and beyond. I mentioned this in my last video, John 10, 10 says, I have come so that you may have life and life abundantly. And he is the way to God and to heaven. He is the truth. The truth will set you free. And he is the life, which he says repeatedly he is life. Okay. Last one. And then we're going to connect a dots. So here's the last one. Jesus says he's the vine. And at, he's still comforting his, his disciples and they're still chatting. This is John 15, one through eight. Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So Jesus tells a lot of stories that are very symbolic, and this is one of them, but they understood this because in that world, they all had vineyards or saw vineyards or whatever. But just like the sheep pen was different, the vineyard's different than what we think of. If you thought of a vineyard today, what would it look like? I live in the middle of New York State. Right down the road from me is the Finger Lakes region, which if you ever get a chance to visit, it's gorgeous in the fall, but you'll have to make reservations way in advance. But that being said, it's full of vineyards. In fact, it has been voted one of the best wine regions in the United States. I know y'all think California, but it's not always California. You go down there and there's just acres and acres and acres of vineyards all along the hillsides going down to the lakes. They are on a trellising system that's probably, I'm gonna guess about maybe five or six feet high, somewhere in here. And they have wires that run. And when you see the grapevines, you'll see a giant trunk. And, and the older they get, the bigger the trunk gets that goes from the ground upward. And then they have what's called the cordons and they're the, they're the stems, they're the branches that go out. Those get tied to the wire and trained. So what happens is from the ground up to that, there's no leaves. So the air gets through and whatever. Now that's our modern day vineyard. Back in those days, they did two or three things. Sometimes they would just let the grape grow on the ground and then they propped them up so that the fruit wouldn't hit the soil and ruin the fruit and get diseased. Sometimes they grew them up a pole. Sometimes they made sort of what I think of as an arbor, which is a rectangle where they would just let them grow up and flop over. So they had that type of understanding and here's how grapes were grown. Jesus talked a whole lot about pruning and throwing out the stuff and getting good fruit. So here's how you grow grapes if you don't know. That giant trunk comes up, the stems come out, they usually do them we do them two-tiered. I think two-tiered is what most do. But what happens is at the end of growing season, the grapes are pruned hard. All that's cut back. I have grapes. I cut them to about four to six good looking buds and let them go all winter. During the growing season, what happens is fairly early on, you will see little tiny, what becomes the clusters of grapes. They're really small. You can follow the branches where the clusters are. Now there's other branches on there sh or shoots. We call them suckers because they suck from the plant. They take the energy, they take the fertilizer, they take everything from the branches that have the grapes on them. So what happens is you cut those off because they only produce leaves, they don't produce fruit, okay? 
And that way you get better fruit, you get more fruit, you get bigger grapes. That's the purpose of the pruning. So when Jesus is talking to these guys and he's saying, I'm the vine. He's saying, I'm the trunk. You guys are the branches. And Jesus even says he gets pruned. So if Jesus gets that done, you're going to get that done. Um, but he says he's the, he's the fruit. And if you remain in him, which means you're learning, you're worshiping, you're reading your Bible, you, you're staying connected. As long as you stay connected to Jesus, you will continue to grow. You may experience pruning once in a while. We all do. It's usually in the form of bad behavior that doesn't produce good fruit. Just throwing that one out there. So as long as you stay connected to Jesus, at, there will come a point in time where you will produce good fruit. Now let me tell you something about not only grapes, but fruit if you've never been around orchards or had fruit trees. Fruiting plants usually take an average of 10 years to produce a really good crop. It doesn't mean there's no fruit in between there, but in general to produce what we think of, like when you see an apple orchard or something, it's about 10 years to get there. Okay, so don't freak out. Some things take time and if you act like an idiot in between and you haven't had that stuff pruned off, that's okay. You'll get there. That's not a big deal. If you don't stay with Jesus, and you don't have to, you'll wither up. Your life will be a different life than the one that he has planned for you. So now I'm gonna connect some dots for you, and of course those dots will go back to the Old Testament because they always do. Exodus 3 is the story of Moses and the burning bush, where he sees the bush, the bush doesn't get burned up, so he goes over to see what's going on, and God has a conversation with him. And he tells Moses, Israel needs a deliverer, all right? This is where there's still slaves in Egypt. And he says, guess who it is, Moses? You, you're gonna do this for me. And Moses says to him in the course of the conversation, he says, it says, Moses said to God, this is Exodus 3, 13 and 14. Moses says to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God says to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to speak to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. I just thought that was really weird because I kind of felt like, number one, what does that mean? Number two, I'm not really feeling like God answered the question. That was just always how I looked at it. Now, I don't know if they ever asked Moses who sent him, but they may have had a very different understanding than we do, that's completely possible. But the understanding that we're going to have now is the fact that Jesus is the I am. He is the one that answered those questions. Who sent you? I am. The great Jesus is the great I am. So what Jesus says in those seven statements, I'm the bread of life, I'm the light of the world, I'm the gate, I'm the good shepherd, I'm the way, the truth, the life, I'm the life and the resurrection, and I'm the vine. That's the I am in Exodus. God doesn't change. We change, we try to change, but God doesn't change. So the I am's Jesus is talking about really does kind of connect to and answer the question when you read that and you think, what does that mean? That's what that means. So I would encourage you to take some time to bounce between this and the other video, or you can go to my blog and read it. It might be faster for you. And take a look at all these scriptures, read the stories for yourself and ponder them and meditate on them and consider what does that mean for you? What does it mean for you? Bread of life, good shepherd, all that stuff. And look at Moses and, and look at what God told him about him being a deliverer and the I am statement. That's my thinking. And that's your assignment for the week, should you choose to accept it. Until uh, the next 
blog and vlog. Have a blessed day.